Hidden audits in state government. Something seems funny, but you're not allowed to see. Colorado senators trip over themselves on impeachment today. Tonight we learn who was telling the truth when an exotic car driver claimed a state trooper let him off with a warning for going 190. And the story of a kid who decided to save a train. That's next. Audits of state government give you, the taxpayer, a chance to see what is happening behind the scenes. Usually, not this time. Two audits of Colorado's IT systems. They hold your personal information. You don't get to see those audits. Politics guy Marshall Zellinger wants to know why. This is your physical footprint. This is what it looks like digitally. It's this footprint that was the subject of two recent state audits, one on how the Department of Education keeps personal data protected, the other on the state's public health department. Both audits have been kept confidential. If we reveal our sources and methods in an audit report, then we give hackers a breadcrumb trail to get at things more quickly than they might otherwise get to it. And that's not the right pathway to go down. This week, Republican State Senator Paul Lundeen convinced the state's legislative audit committee to keep private the public part of a Department of Education IT audit on something called a mission critical system. Mission critical is a really big, broad term. But since the audit is not public, we don't know what mission critical exactly means. Though Lundeen says the type of information the Department of Education keeps could perhaps be held against a student later in life if that data were leaked. If an insurance company says, you know what, we, we have access to data that says you weren't a great student and therefore you're going to get the less preferred rate on your insurance, that would be a misuse of data. A different audit was reviewed today by the Joint Budget Committee, the lawmakers that help determine how and where the state spends money every year. This one dealt with CDPHE, the Public Health Department's IT systems. Does more money need to be spent on IT or is is it not being spent wisely? That conversation about your taxpayer money and your personal data was done in private. We always ask questions of departments about how they are using taxpayer dollars efficiently. And when there was an audit done, we wanted to ask more questions. And in order to do that on a confidential audit, we had to go into executive session. So what might your footprint look like within the state health department computers? I asked the state's IT office, and I was told some things you might expect, others you might not. Health information, sure. Addresses, social security numbers, and even tax information, Kyle. What we're talking about with this data, this isn't about stealing your credit. This is more intrusive than that. Sure, and at the end of the day, people are going to have various levels of trust in government. What's that, that old journalism saying? If your mother says she loves you, check it out. You know, we tend to be maybe a little more skeptical than some. I mean, we vote these people into office to do a job, but, you know, as journalists, we like to make sure that, hey, an audit really dealt, tells us what's going on behind the scenes, and when we can't even see that, then we have to just question a little bit more and hope that the people that are elected are doing the right thing. Thank you, Marshall. Colorado's congressional delegation is proceeding down predictably partisan paths on impeachment. As House Democrats unveil articles of impeachment today, Colorado's House Democrats are all expected to vote for them, all of Colorado's Republicans against. If the House votes for impeachment as expected, the trial and potential removal of President Trump would be in the hands of the Senate. Colorado's Democratic Senator Michael Bennett said today he will likely you, vote to impeach. Where, sir, you want me to... No, you won't. Nope, that's what they do in the House. Right. This doesn't happen often, so you can understand some confusion over the process. We assume that Bennett means that he will be voting to remove President Trump from office. Colorado's Republican Senator Cory Gardner called impeachment a total circus to appease the far left. But Gardner said as a juror, He'll be fair. Nothing says fairness like partisanship and name calling in the same sentence, too. Another Democrat who missed the memo that his party has already selected former Governor Hickenlooper to run for Senate is DU professor David Goldfisher. Just got into the Democratic primary race today. I don't want to be the one to tell him about Hickenlooper. He teaches on national security and he's consulted at the Pentagon, so he has real credentials. Goldfisher says he'd like to focus on what he calls a humane immigration policy, climate change and universal health care. Most of the high-profile Democrats in the Senate primary dropped out once party bosses got behind former Governor Hickenlooper. The Lamborghini driver claimed that a Colorado state trooper did not care that he was going 190 miles per hour, fast and not at all furious. The self-proclaimed Lambro was bragging on YouTube about just getting a warning. Our Steve Stager has been trying to figure out who's telling the truth here. The State Patrol or the Lambro? He goes, you know how fast you're going? 
I go 200, he goes 190. It would be a hell of a story if only it were true. Last month, after pictures of the 190 and a 65 warning were spreading around, we questioned both CSP and the driver, James Teague, the dude wearing a hat that says Lambros. From the get-go, CSP told us Teague just made contact with that trooper and asked for a souvenir. Teague told a different story on YouTube and initially to us. He says he really was going that fast. This driver was looking for his 15 minutes of fame and put this out there knowing it wasn't truthful. We asked for dash cam for Master Trooper Christopher Wright from that day, November 2nd. If Wright turned the lights on in his vehicle or got it to a certain speed, the camera turns on. We got two of the three videos recorded that day when Wright stopped to check on an abandoned car and when he passed a tractor that appears to have dumped a load. No video of a Lambo. Oh, the fact that there wasn't video kind of helps show that this, this didn't happen. We, we didn't stop a car going that fast. CSP spokesman Blake White also gave us this photo taken that day of Trooper Wright posing with Lambro's Lambo. This Lamborghini driver, affectionately known as Lambro, pulled in behind and started having conversations. They've blurred out Wright's face. We've requested a copy without that redaction. It shows the sports car behind the trooper's car, not protocol for a traffic stop. And the way he represented online was not truthful. And our member made some, made a poor decision to issue a fake warning ticket to play a prank on someone. CSP will only tell us there was an internal discipline process for the trooper and appropriate action was taken. As for the third video on Wright's dash cam, the one they didn't release to us, they tell us it is in no way related to the Lamborghini stop. It was another traffic stop that hasn't been resolved in court yet. That's why they couldn't release it. And radio traffic from that day that we also got a copy of backs up that story about that video. There was another traffic stop he made that day. Yeah. And they're saying basically they can't release that video until everything's settled in court. I, it's a little bit reassuring. I don't know, somebody who drives on the roads, that it, it, it appears that it was a trooper who decided to make a joke that he wasn't supposed to, to make as opposed to just, oh, yeah, go 200 down the highway, CSP don't care. The question is, too, I mean, he did do it using an official form. You couldn't, like, yeah. you don't have any, like, from the desk of trooper whatever <laughs> that you could just write it up yeah. in your car. Yeah. And... Well, it's bad news for Lambro. I, I know we've enjoyed talking to him. He's a, he's a fascinating character. He's an interesting guy. Yeah, I like his hats. Thanks, Steve. <laughs> Hemp has been legal for nearly a year, yet banks still had to report hemp business to the government as suspicious. That requirement is now being lifted, but Colorado's Bankers Association tells us they still have an issue because hemp businesses use their crop as collateral. And as we've often talked about here, that crop sometimes tests too high for THC, too much like marijuana, and then those hemp growers lose their crop and they can default on their loans. Elbra Wedgworth is looking ahead to her retirement. In her rear view are accomplishments as memorable as her name, like overseeing the reopening of Union Station and being the first woman of color to lead the Downtown Denver Partnership. Wedgworth sat down with our Anusha Roy to talk about the challenges of yesterday and today. Elbra Wedgworth's footprint stretches across the city, from her name etched into the DMV building on Tremont to the changes she made as a city councilor. Her role in overseeing the big redo of Union Station five years ago and currently working at Denver Health. Growing up in East Denver in a housing project to being in this chair right now, and no, not at all. She said it's taking retirement for her to properly sit and reflect on her public career that started in Denver in the 1980s. When you grew up like I did and, you know, you come from a poor family and you think you can accomplish things and people, you want to make something of yourself. You know, uh, failure is a, a good motivator. Wedgworth was the first person of color to chair the Downtown Denver Partnership in 2013, giving her a unique perspective on how the city is changing. You know, when you're a woman of color, you know, you basically want people to recognize you for your leadership because people can look at you and know that you're a woman of color, but you have to prove that you can also lead. And you bring other women with you because women have power. After three decades, she realized she helped open the door for other women and minorities, but the impact was limited. Sometimes I look back on things that we, I thought we accomplished 30 years ago, and we're fighting the battles again. Wedgworth, who is now days away from retirement, is still waiting for the day Colorado elects a woman to the U.S. Senate, a female governor or Denver mayor. So her message is one she told herself 
over and over again since the 80s. Put your mind to something and you can accomplish anything. So Wedgworth said that after retiring this month from her position with Denver Health, she's hoping to switch to a more mentorship role, especially for the younger generation in Denver. And Kyle, she's hoping to tap away a little bit from the public spotlight as mm -hmm. well and spend some time with her family. Yeah. And, and interesting that she notes that issues that she thought were put to bed mm -hmm. are being faced by that generation that she wants to work with. Yeah, and that's a conversation she mm -hmm. said she's going to continue having with anyone who's willing to sit down and talk with her about it. All right. Thank you, Nusha. A 36 year veteran of the Denver Police Force has something he wants to say. If you don't manage this PTSD, if you don't do something to cope with it, uh, it takes over your life, it runs your life. He wants other first responders to know help exists. And a father and son are taking on an enormous project, 22 tons worth. Next. Hello, welcome back. A break from the snow for the next couple of days and with sunshine today, highs in the 40s. It felt great, a little bit cooler than average, but the trend is for warmer weather. High and mid-level clouds are coming in on the northwest flow and creating some lenticular clouds out there and a lot of great pictures coming in tonight. We have high pressures, our dominant feature, the cold air beginning to push east. The next storm moving on shore in California. It will be here Friday into the weekend. More of a mountain snow producer, but Denver may see a few snow showers as early as Friday night, but not this night. We 
we have fair skies and light winds with a little bit of foothill cloud cover and a few light snow showers around Steamboat and Aspen, but no advisories for travel. Partly cloudy, low 20s in the city. That's where we start tomorrow, but our high will be close to 50 as we move through Wednesday, Thursday and Friday. Friday night, chance for a snow shower the same Saturday. Another cold front Sunday keeps us cold as we end the weekend and start the new week. But as we start the new week with sunshine, temperatures will stay in the 30s on Monday. Kathy, thank you. He is a 36 year veteran of the Denver Police Force, an Army veteran. He also used opioids to deal with post-traumatic stress disorder. He even considered taking his own life. Officer Brian Barry does not mind us sharing that because he is too. My name is Brian V. Barry and I work for the Denver Police Department for the city and county of Denver. I'd like to share my story for every first responder that's out there about PTSD. I've been living with PTSD and depression. That was brought about by the traumatic experiences that we all see, hear, smell. So we experience the emotions of the victims' families. We see the victims in the worst type of situations and worst forms. The hardest thing I've ever had to see or, or deal with is uh, children's deaths. There's no way that you cannot be affected by it. It creates a heavy toll on your mental health. The depression is deep. If you don't manage this PTSD, if you don't do something to cope with it, it takes over your life, it runs your life. I had suicidal ideations. It put me in a very dark place and to where I couldn't communicate with my kids, I couldn't communicate with my wife anymore. And that's what finally brought her to say that she would leave me if I didn't get any help. For over 40 years, I denied it, that anything was ever wrong with me, that I was absolutely fine until it was brought to my attention and it was given to me in a clinician's office that I wasn't okay and that I wasn't fine. I want people to take away from my story that you can survive. You can manage this, you can get through it. I want all the first responders to know, even the dispatchers and call takers to know that there is help out there and you need to ask for it. Yes, indeed, there is help out there for anybody who needs it. The Colorado Crisis Services line offers support 24 seven. Not talking about a referral to somebody a day or two later, somebody who is ready to talk now. You can call 1-844-493-8255 or text the word TALK to 38255. A plan to take apart an old train runs smack dab into one young man's fascination. I didn't want it to be demolished. He's convinced his dad it can be a family project. We worked with them and they said you can save it as long as you do so before it's uh, the, the wrecking crew comes in. That's next.
Kids in every corner of Colorado love playing with trains, and a young man in Louisville has a favorite he is adding to his collection. Weighs about 22 tons. Our Travis Cachatorian has that. Daddy, I'm really happy Me and too. excited. I know, this is going to be so cool. Taking on a father-son project can be a ton of work. For Travis Ramos yeah. and his son Tate. Yeah, we can work down on that, and that one's loose too. It's 22 and a half tons to be exact. Lots of challenges. We got a little more than we bargained for, but we're excited to, to keep the process going here. About a month ago, Travis and Tate stumbled upon some bad news. I was actually just walking by the old train cars restaurant, and I came back here to take a look at the caboose just because I hadn't seen it in a few years, and there's a notice of demolition on the door. My name is Tate, and I'm seven years old, and we're going to save the caboose. That's when the whole Ramos family devised a plan to cut the caboose free from its tracks and move it across town to be restored Yay! before its scheduled demolition. I just think it's a really fun project. It's one of the biggest projects I've ever done. There's a lot of firsts uh, in the process of doing this. We learned how to uh, drive an excavator with you know Tate uh, sitting in my lap uh, and, and his brother Reed as well. It's been hard work going under there. There's spiders everywhere. There's dust. There's pieces of cement and things. Thank you for helping support the Louisville Caboose. No me, no me, Dad. They put in a lot of work, but saving the caboose was going to take a lot more money than these two could take on alone. So they reached out to the Louisville community for help. Oh my gosh, it's, the response has been amazing. Uh, we put out the, the campaign on Friday, and within about 48 hours, we raised about 60% of what we needed just from the community coming together, sharing it you know, on Facebook, on Instagram, and otherwise. Uh -huh. Travis and Tate still have thousands more to raise. You know, we're going to band together and, and, and make this happen. Every donation going towards saving memories past. I'm so excited! And creating new ones, too. For next, Travis Ketchatorian. They figured they'll need about $14,000 to move the train with a crane and then restore it and hopefully put it on display in downtown Louisville. Your holiday fail stories are like an advent calendar with the chocolates each night. We open one up and it is delicious. That and your feedback next.
We count down to Hanukkah and Christmas with your holiday fails, remembering it's the thought that counts. The main course, though, also counts because you'll be hungry without it, or someone will be. Eileen told us about the time that they were about to sit down to eat when they look out the window and see the family's beagle dragging a fully cooked turkey across the yard. It wasn't theirs. They were eating something else. They never did figure out where the turkey came from. Send your best, worst holiday stories to next at 9news.com, or you can get our attention with the hashtag HeyNext. I finished with feedback tonight from Daryl, who says, if you all impeach all of the political people that have done unlawful or unethical behavior, there would be nobody to run the government. I got to ask you, Daryl, I don't know what line of work you're in. Is everybody in your line of work crooked? No. Nah, I didn't think so either. Hey, public office is not all that different. Just because we scrutinize all of them does not mean that they're all crooks. We'll see you next time.